is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Gravity Falls, Season 2, Episode 14, The Stanchurian Candidate. In this episode, Grunkle Stan decides, since pretty much he doesn't have anything better to do, to run for mayor of Gravity Falls once Kerfufterfumple passes away. But Stan isn't really so much a people person. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Natasha. Thank you very much to Melanie for commissioning this episode and once again being flexible. I had a storm um, over the weekend and so big storm, it was two days long and lost internet. And I had one of the most stressful days yesterday, not having internet really just, I don't recommend it. It's thumbs down, bad time. Uh, and this episode, I just watched this morning before recording, and I was really surprised. I saw it called The, the Stanchurian Candidate, which is a reference to the movie Manchurian Candidate, which I have never seen, but I do know that it has to do with like mind control stuff and like sleeper cells and that kind of thing, trigger phrases. Um, and so I figured that it was going to be some sort of like election type thing, but I had it in my head that it would be a much smaller deal. Mayor of Gravity Falls is more public than I thought the Pines were going to care to be after everything that has gone down recently. Um, and the opening of this episode, Stan is in bed and he wakes up and just has one of those mornings. And after what I went through yesterday, it felt really really close to home. Everything just goes wrong. From the moment he wakes up, he hurts. That's really the first thing is knowing that he's going to have to deal with this like aging and everything and just the act of sleeping while it is supposed to be restorative. Once you start to get older, it's more of a fucking crapshoot because you just, you can sleep in the wrong position and that can ruin your body for like four straight days. <laughs> it's really kind of unfair that it's like this as you get older, that, you know, when your body is the most, is growing more and more fragile, that even sleeping works against you at times, unless you have everything perfectly positioned. And even when you do, you can think you do. And then it turns out you're super wrong about that. So anyway, when he just wakes up and is immediately like, oh, cool, what new body pains do I have to deal with today? I was like, ah, oh, Stan, I feel you. Then he goes to put his feet in his slippers and they are soaking wet. And there's a note that says, dear Stan, I needed to so needed something to carry milk in. So I used your slippers. Love Mabel. And it's written on this little piece of paper that's got a smiley face star wearing pink polka dot underwear and that has like a stream of rainbow coming out of its back. Honestly, the details of the stuff that Mabel uses in this show are some of my favorite little like, they're not even quite jokes. They are a little bit, but I am just so like team Mabel in terms of aesthetic, like it's way too cutesy and gross. So I like, I'll, it just goes over to the side of like, nah, not for me, but it is so close. It's so close. And I just really feel like me and Mabel would get along really well. So he decides to like, keep walking around in these milky squishy slippers, which is the worst. He goes down to the kitchen and turns on the light and it immediately burns out again so relatable, these things. So he goes to get a light bulb from the box and there are no bulbs in it, but there is a note. Dear Stan, I took these to build a planetarium suit for Seuss. Sorry, 
Dipper. And there's an illustration of Seuss in what looks to be just like a black hooded body stocking with light bulbs attached all over his body. What is this? Can anyone help me out? What is a planetarium suit? I don't understand. I mean, I want to know, though. That illustration, just, does Seuss just sort of, like, stand in a the center of a room and then twirl? Is that, like, so that he's, like, the planets? Like, the light? I don't know. But anyway... This is one of those moments where I have had a, a couple over this past week, a couple of these moments of just being so glad that I don't have children, like so deeply in my soul glad. And while I know Dipper and Mabel are good kids who mean well, they just are, they're a perfect example of kids that you love that you know don't actually mean any harm utterly ruining your goddamn day. And I have to give Sue so much credit because never once in this episode at all does he get angry at them. He's irritated at the inconvenience of having to go and get light bulbs, but he never comes back and is like, what the fuck, guys? Seriously? He never storms into Mabel's room holding up his slippers going, why did you use these to carry milk? I thought this episode was going to be about Stan being like, despite the title, Stan starting to feel like he is ready for the kids to move out. Straight up, that's how I started to think this was going to go. And instead, he just totally rolls with it in a way that I admire and wish that I could imitate. Because I am not capable of this shit, man. I don't roll with things. I don't know if y'all know this about me. I am not the most flexible person in the world. I wish so much that I could be. Because then days like yesterday where I have no internet and thus I have a whole day off wouldn't feel like a fucking prison sentence. They would be like, oh, that didn't go the way I planned, but now I have this big open day ahead of me in which I can do whatever I want. Instead, what I did was sat in front of my computer for several hours, checking the internet every 10 minutes because I needed it. And I wasted half my day wanting this to be fixed and then eventually came to terms with the fact that it wasn't going to be fixed by the time I needed it and just played Animal Crossing. And that was how I spent my, my day that I could have done some cleaning. I could have taken a nice hot bath and given myself a face mask. I could have gone for a walk. I could have done all kinds of things. I did not do any of that because I am so inflexible that when my plans get interrupted, rather than figure out a better plan, I just cling harder to the plans. It's not good. It's stupid, illogical, unhelpful, and ultimately eats away at my mental health. And I just want to be better. So Grunkle Stan... I never thought I'd say this, but I wish I could be more like you. Good on you, buddy. So anyway, we go to him at the grocery store, fucking buying these, uh, these light bulbs and the kids behind them, um, behind him talking about how they don't want to get in line behind him because he's an old person who's probably going to pay with pennies and war bonds, which honestly was a pretty good joke. I don't like, I don't have that instinct the second that I get behind somebody in line who's older. I don't immediately go, oh man, I don't want to be behind this person because it's not always true. But there are times where I will realize I've made a terrible mistake. And it's usually with somebody, it's either somebody who's old or it's somebody who is accompanied by a couple of children. And it's not their fault. They just have so much to keep track of that paying is like this ordeal. Um, and oftentimes when it's somebody with multiple kids, they're also pinching pennies. And so they've got like 11 coupons and man, I just like, it can be rough. I saw somebody the other day still paying groceries with a check. Like I didn't even know we were allowed to do that anymore. I didn't like, I remember buying groceries with a check myself back in like 2000, maybe. 
I did not realize that was still a thing at all. For me, the idea of checks are pretty much relegated to paying bills. And when you use a paper check, you're really risking a lot. People get worried about like online uh, breaks for insecurity. But like you are literally mailing a piece of paper that has your bank account information and address on it for anybody to just grab, which to me is lunacy. Um, Austin says that's an old person stereotype for me paying checks, paying, paying checks at the grocery store. Yeah. It's like I, the person I saw doing it was actually sort of young. And it was one of those moments that of, I think a little bit of insight where I think maybe this person wasn't doing super well. And so they were floating checks in order to be able to like make it until payday. Cause that's to me, the only function of a check anymore is like you use that to buy yourself some time to get the money in the account, but still technically have paid what you need in the moment. Um, but anyway, so yeah, they, he gets really irritated. He says something about how he had been actually planning to ship, uh, shoplift all of these instead. The security gets called. He drops a smoke bomb that says expired 11, 1996, and it does not go off. And can we also talk about the fact that Grunkle Stan is at the grocery store, apparently in just his boxer shorts, robe and slippers, which I mean, this is one of the advantages to getting older is you really just stop giving fucks like that. Like, I it just you, you start to be like, what are you going to do? Oh, really? I shouldn't have left the house like this. Are you going to arrest me? What can anybody do? Nothing. That's what. Give me my fucking light bulbs. <laughs> so... He winds up getting tackled by security and eventually makes it home later, battered and bruised and carrying these light bulbs and very excited that he is going to be able to finally fix the problem of the blown bulb in his kitchen and turns the corner only to find his brother in the midst of putting in a bulb that he invented that will last 10,000 years and make your skin softer, which... I can't really be that mad at Grunkle Stan for feeling like he's really kind of out of it. Um, there's just this like, the, there is a competition, a competitiveness between the two of them that has been going on. And it's not like, I feel like, Stan, again, has handled that better than I thought he would. But it's not. It, it, there's going to be a point at which you can't. He, he has able to hand. He has been able to handle his brother outdoing him at stuff when their goals in life are very divergent. But now we've reached this like point where they are living together. And I don't want to say like competing for the affection of the kids because that is unfair but there's a sort of like uh there, there's just a proximity that i think changes the dynamic of that now and i appreciate that this is sort of what motivates him to want to do something more with his life it's like seeing the kids worshiping his brother <laughs> and his brother is so put together and manages to do things with like, not just adult competence, but like panache. I feel really bad for Grunkle Stan for like, I don't know, the best, he tries his best, but he's just not this kind of person. So I just feel really bad that he's in this position right now where it's like he has really done a lot to care for these kids and grown very attached to them. But somebody can come in and in just a, you know, what, a week, maybe begin to overshadow him, even though he has really I mean, he has kept a lot secret from them and he did lie to them. And to a point, I can understand why they would be. But it doesn't feel like that's a factor for them anymore. You know, narratively speaking, they don't bring that up. They don't say we can't trust you. It seems like it's much more a uh, novelty 
here's somebody who's also related to them who can do things that are almost like uh, an action movie in terms of what he's been through, the things he's seen, and his abilities. And I just really, man, I am feeling it for Stan this episode and wanted him so bad to succeed when he starts like running for mayor. And I felt very disappointed when I realized how completely predictable it is that he does not know how to talk to people at all. I really should have known, but I thought that Stan would do better because of the fact that he is a grifter and a con artist I always kind of like, you know, I mean, if you are a grifter and con artist and you are a uh, politician, those things seem to go together way better. And I would have thought he'd know how to fudge things a little bit so that it comes across as more palatable to people, even though we know like what I thought was going to be was Grunkle Stan going up there. And telling everybody exactly what they want to hear and then going backstage and like fucking laughing to himself into his sleeve about how none of that is going to happen. He made a bunch of promises he has no intention of keeping, maybe like getting his palms greased by some local business who asked him to like promote them. I thought it was going to be Stan doing something really, really well that he thought would get the kids respect. And instead, it's just showing us again how much of a kind of shyster he is so he would be doing this in an effort to get their respect and he would realize that what he was doing was not was doing the opposite was making them be like oh man come on stan and i'm kind of glad it didn't go that way because if it had i feel like that would have been a pretty accurate depiction of Stan. And he would have been very, very bummed at the fact that they don't, uh, that who he is disappoints them, you know? So the way that they have it go actually works out better to me. But initially I, I was surprised at how bad he is at this because I was like, Oh, a politician that seems right up his alley, you know? Um, so anyway, Man, this fucking Disney Plus is killing me, guys. I just paused it and it just went right back to the menu. Why do they do this? Also, can we talk about the fact that the uh, artist rendering of the Mayor Buffle Thumpter or whatever his name is going to be, they have that like on the news when he gets the announcement um, and it looks like there is a straight up dick in the middle of this guy's face. I think that it's supposed to be eventually like his giant nose with the wart on it or something, but it looks like a giant penis. And I just got very distracted and was like, am I supposed to? And then I realized like, no, I think that was just me. Um, so he decides that he is going to go ahead and run for mayor. And when he goes to the meeting, um, I actually, when he gets to the meeting, it looks like maybe he doesn't. Oh yeah. Melanie says this Stan seems more like the magic gold teeth slash can't lie Stan. Yeah. And that's part of it. Melanie is. I also forgot that while Stan is a grifter, he isn't good at it. You know, he has had to be on the run his entire life and has this like, fucking criminal record that is pages long because he gets caught pretty much every time he's managed to like basically survive but we saw that in the flashbacks there was a point where he was like hiding from loan sharks in a hotel room with no money for fucking food like so i yeah i just had this expectation of what this was going to be like and it was totally different and i'm fine with that it was just my my mistake um so anyway when Grunkle Stan sees the ad or the the news bit about how the mayor died, I thought he had decided at that moment that he was going to run for mayor. But we go to the like actual town hall meeting and it seems as if he hasn't totally decided by the time they get there. And what motivates him is a uh, fucking what's his face whose name I forget, who's Gideon's dad. Um, 
And he is the one that's going to run. And he fully anticipates that he is going to run with unopposed. Um, and we find out a little bit later, unsurprisingly, that this gambit is just to get Gideon in the position where his dad is mayor and can pardon him and get him out of jail. So, oh, Austin says he survived by faking his death. That's true. That's true. Um, so he goes up there. He announces that he is going to uh, run for mayor. Fucking, are you still in contact with little Gideon? He asks a question and his response is, that is an excellent question. I'm going to give you 50% off of a used car. And of course, everybody, it turns out, has like a coupon under their seats for 50% off. And it is a pretty good gambit initially when you're dealing with like a small town. I can see it, something like this that seems really cheap and obvious actually working really well. Because people are very, very stupid. But this gets fucking Grunkle Stan really irritated because he, first of all, does not like this guy. They have been mortal enemies. Uh, Bud Gleeful, that's his name. And there's something Sue says about how, like, we don't have a lot of options. So I guess... Oh my god, I forgot he says. We don't have a lot of options. Everyone in this town is a tad strange... Except, ironically, Tad Strange. And then the camera pans over to this dude in a short-sleeved business, uh, like, bo short-sleeved button-up with a tie. Hi, guys. Tad's the name, and being normal's my game. Uh, Mabel runs up and says, loving you, Tad. And he says, and I love bread. Can I tell you guys, I was watching this with Owen and he started fucking falling out laughing. He said that this was very similar to some Simpsons joke about uh, uh, somebody's being named like butt or something like that. But anyway, this joke I thought was pretty good, but I just needed y'all to know that he really appreciated it in a way. And I am always, in, I always enjoy watching something with a person who really gets jokes that I like can appreciate, but it doesn't hit me the same way. It's just fun to watch somebody else like really react. Uh, Austin says, Tad is voiced by the guy who does that podcast. Welcome to Night Vale. Oh, okay. Um, so yeah, they're all talking about how, well, maybe if, uh, Uncle Ford was here, he could run for mayor and this would all work out better. And really, that seems to be the thing for Stan that he's just like, you know what, I am sick of this, I'm gonna fucking do this. And I really was like a little heartbroken that that's what it is that they again, say something about his brother and that pushes him. So Grunkle Stan, he, he stands up and makes his pledge. Uh, and Bud Gleeful says something about how he's a two bit carnival barker and his face, uh, or he has like ears bigger than his head. The whole thing is really honestly accurate. And he says that everybody should kind of, a bunch of people stand up and they all throw their hats in the ring. And one of them, and help me out guys in the audience, his name escapes me. Get it. Get it. Spoiler alert, later on, he wins and he is given a bouquet and hugs it as he blushes and says, got it. And I swear to God, that's one of the best things on this show that's ever happened. There is, it's a, such a perfect combo of the illustration being so over the top his eyes with like the stars in them and the lashes and his blushing, the fact that he's given flowers, which doesn't really. <laughs> and then the utter sincerity of the got it. Like he's so excited that he could barely say it. It was very, very well done. 
So anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. But the face off between Stan and uh, Bud, I mean, Bud is just super, super irritated that Stan has fucked this shit up. He intended to run unopposed, do what he needed to do to help his kid. And as he says, let bygones be bygones because his family, Stan's family is the one that got his son locked up. So he had, he claims, and I'm not sure bygones were going to be bygones. He says that. I don't know if that's actually true, but he, what he's saying now is I am going to take you down and I'm going to do it really fucking hard. And, uh, when, Mabel and Dipper go and talk to Grunkle Stan about throwing his hat in the ring. And they basically tell him they don't think he's going to be able to pull this off. He says that he feels like he doesn't have a legacy, um, that his brother is doing stuff that's like really advanced and going to make him famous. And he's going to leave, you know, his mark on the world. And what are people going to remember about him? And that is sort of what pushes Mabel and Dipper to feel like they want to support Stan, even though when it comes down to it by support, they just mean get him elected no matter whether he deserves it or not. And I'm not even that mad at them for that because it's easy to get caught up in that part of things when you are, when you're trying to help somebody, when there's a very particular definitive goal that's easily measurable and we get, they talk about the, uh, the way the election works. The Wednesday stump speech held on an actual stump. The Friday debate wherein townsfolk throw bird seed at the candidate they like most. At the end, they release a freedom eagle who will fly to the candidate covered in the most seed and bestow a birdly kiss upon him. And this is indeed exactly how it goes. It is amazing. This is so weird and amazing. And I love it. Also, everybody is like Wendy has drawn um, on the on the side of uh, Waddles swines for pine <laughs> for pines, which I really liked. Bud's a dud is on the other time uh, other side. And it's just a nice moment of everybody being on this team together working to do this. So they have a phone bank, which is a bunch of different phones, including a hamburger phone. And I think like a, a whale or a dolphin phone. And Grunkle Stan has to do his phone interview. And I guess he's like on the radio. You're listening to falls radio, 24 hour news and bear rampage alerts. And now here's the T man. And he asks Stan, how do you feel about the American flag to which Grunkle Stan says, I can take it or leave it too many stripes. Next question. Uh, what would you do to help educate our kids? Simple. Put them on an Island and make them fight for dominance. Also teach, teach kids swears. That'll bring them into the real world. What would you do about the crime in gravity falls? Do you mean crime in general or just the specific crimes committed by me? And at this point, Dipper has jumped in and snipped the phone line because this is going very, very badly. I love that Mabel shows him that they have already started memeing him and they've done, or no, it's Wendy. Uh, one does not simply teach kids swear words. And it's the one does not simply Sean Bean meme. I feel like that's one of the like most linked to the real world jokes that show has done. Everything is pretty in universe. And that is one of the few that's like a really recognizable reference to stuff that we deal with, you know? Um, but yeah, it has already started to go very, very downhill. He is in negative approval ratings and Grunkle Stan is not, he doesn't understand the fuck ups that he made, even though everybody around him is telling him that was no good, even though the ratings have plummeted, even though it's like the memes that are out there are making fun of him. He, it's still not really sinking in that he is 
that he needs advice and help. So Mabel and Dipper have written him some talking points and he puts them in his pocket, but then basically refuses to use their advice. He says, I will say words that come out of my brain. If somebody has an ugly baby, I'm just going to tell them that they have an ugly baby. And Dipper goes down to Ford and is asking him what he should do. And Ford has this basically mind control tie. There's two and one of them controls the person wearing the other. This is really well done because what the show does is they really give you a second to truly appreciate how incredibly fucked up this is with Seuss before they go and play this with Grunkle Stan. Now, with Grunkle Stan, he is not as... He's, he's, when he finds out that they're using this tie, he's upset that they felt the need to control him and didn't believe in him. But he's not upset about the principle of being violated that way, which is fine. But I like the fact that the show decides to explore that, even though that's not going to be the point. They still want everybody to sort of like appreciate, I think, just how incredibly upsetting this would be to have happened to you and at least give that its moment for you to absorb even though that's not going to be the focus and I kind of admire that they even bothered because I would not have blamed them if they just ignored completely that this is a violation of somebody's body and free will if they decided to ignore it it's a you know it's a cartoon it's a messed up thing to do, but it's also something that ha- like we have seen in cartoons and it's played for laughs. And if they wanted to do that, that'd be fine. But I really admire them taking the time and treating it this seriously because like it's funny in that in what Mabel is having Seuss do, but his reactions to it are really like he stops after Mabel makes him like sing and do this dance and is like sweating on the ground. He gets up and says, guys, something weird just happened. I'm really freaked out. And he looks like he's going to fall into a fucking fetal position until Mabel makes him, she says, I am Seustron. Watch me eat this pine cone, bend down and fucking picks it up. And she lets go of him and he crumples to the ground and is crying and saying, oh, my gosh, my life just flashed before my eyes. And he's like really, really genuinely fucked up over it. And honestly, I think that was great. I think they did a really good job. <laughs> yeah, Melanie's in the chat saying poor Seuss and like 100% agree. I feel like Seuss kind of owes them one for that. You know, I wouldn't be mad if he decided to get back at them in a way. But that's not his nature. He's not a uh, grudging person. So, yeah, I just wanted to mention how it, it they could have just not dealt with this. And the they didn't make it a plot point, but they definitely acknowledge how messed up it is. So then we go to the mayoral speeches on the stump and we have the first use of this tie which is when stan immediately uh starts to surge in the polls because these two children know what to say better than a full grown-ass man um so he starts to say something about how the women in gravity falls all wear too much makeup but then he immediately gets uh, intercepted by Mabel, who says, you ladies all look great. And did you do something with your hair? You are working it. And I love the women in the audience. And one of them says, that is exactly what I need to hear right now. Um, you may know me as that guy who accidentally let all those bees loose in that elementary school a few years back. And then Dipper jumps in. But I believe in things, America, freedom, America, freedom. And then that guy in the fucking audience, 
He's saying all the right things. And he's got an American flag hat. He's got an American flag shirt. And later on, he rips off the American flag shirt to show the American flag tattoo that he has on underneath his shirt. And honestly, it's pretty good. It's it's like one of those jokes that's played out if you think if you like look at it in its larger parts, but they do it so well that it still feels very relevant. Um, and I lo- love that he turns the thing about how he has such huge ears into a bit of his, like, if you want a candidate who will listen to you, I'm all ears. And then he goes out there and does a break dance. And a part of me really thought when he was done, he was going to have sustained some serious injuries. <laughs> like he starts off this episode in bed, having been asleep and in pain. And I kind of thought that later on after this fucking thing, he would be like, what happened to me? My body feels terrible, but it winds up being fine, evidently. So, uh, so that's good. So he is ahead in the polls at this point and they, uh, are taking his pictures and he is getting all of this like great press stands the man stand a hit with the elderly underdog is over dog everything is coming up stand pines meanwhile buddy gleeful is literally sweating and says that he needs to go and speak to his campaign manager and leaves behind all of the people that are apparently volunteering with him He goes into a room labeled campaign manager. Do not disturb. And it's like a room like covered in locks. And when he goes in, there is this camera and a whole setup for Gideon to speak to him from prison. And Gideon is absolutely wrathful at the fact that his father is losing I can't sleep because my cellmate took my pillow for a wife. They don't have hair products in here. At this point, ghost eyes and that one other guy come up and say, hey, best friend, don't be late for friendship bracelet class. And he screams about how he has finger painting at the same time and they go running off. Um, So, yeah. He is telling, and honestly, I got to say, he says the mayor dying has, is my one ticket out of here. And I thought we were going to get a reveal that somehow Buddy killed the mayor, that this was all like something that he had managed to orchestrate. Um, But it seems that's not going to be the way the show goes with it. It seems like they're just going to have it be a coincidence that he's taking advantage of, which is totally fine. I don't. Like, there's this temptation that I think a lot of writers have to make everything link up and be significant rather than, uh, you know, let there be any coincidence in their universe. They want there to be an explanation for it all that feels really clever and tidy. And I don't subscribe to that sort of idea like that for me it doesn't need to be that way um but yeah so i just i really i'm i'm fine with it oh yeah and austin says they showed the guy was 102 regardless austin i mean you know that that just makes it all the easier to murder a guy but yeah i just wanted to say that even though uh, I think that my theory is wrong, I'm not disappointed by that at all. I actually kind of prefer it this way, but I thought that they might do that. So yeah, he is yelling at his father that he is going to be the way that uh, Gideon gets out of jail and that he has to keep up his end of things. And when his father is beginning to show signs of not really wanting to be as committed as Gideon is, Gideon pulls out this piece of paper from his hair, by the way, which I think is so perfect that he says he's been saving for a long time. 
And he begins to chant something. And his father seems to immediately know what the fuck it is that Gideon is up to. Gideon says something like, come on, dad, maybe you just need to have more of an open mind. And he says it with this real fucking sinister look on his face. Um, And his dad backs up against the wall. No, not that, please. And it's honestly like, he starts yelling anything but that and screaming. And it's a pretty dark moment. I feel like this show with this and Seuss uh, and, you know, actual people suffering, they are showing us some darker stuff than what they tend to do. They'll, they will show us things that are like, in principle, upsetting, but they will rarely show people like in pain or or upset in this sort of emotional way for long periods. And I was just like a little bit sorry for Bud Gleeful here. Like he's obviously a garbage human being who raised a garbage son, but also this moment I just was like, Oh, that's really rough, man. So Gideon basically possesses his father And then decides to run his father's campaign the way that he would run his own campaign, which is very hilarious because his dad is just, he doesn't have that like little boy charm quality that Gideon was able to cash in on, but that does not stop Gideon at all. He just decides to play that up anyway and has like, he puts on these like, uh, I think sequin pants at one point like he's got his whole look is Gideon but it's just a a, like on this like older dude like honestly I would love to know where he found sequin pants that even fit him like I would like sequin pants and I haven't had any luck in that area but you know whatever I'm not bitter about it Um, maybe he made them. Maybe Gideon is like an amazing seamstress who made all of his own clothing and he is getting into the sewing room as soon as he takes over his dad's body and creating custom costumes for him. Um, meanwhile, Grunkle Stan is very high on himself because he thinks that he has managed to jump up in the polls by like speaking from the heart because Somehow, Grunkle Stan is so disconnected from himself that he doesn't even realize the things that he has been saying are not from his own brain. And that's a very specific difference between him and like how Seuss reacts. When Seuss starts dancing and singing, it's very clear to Seuss, this was not me. I didn't have control over myself. I don't know what just happened to me. I like this obviously came from the outside and some something went wrong here. But Grunkle Stan, it's like because even though he isn't in control of himself and he isn't the one that's making the choices on what to say, it seems like just the fact that they turn out to be the right choices and the right words, he's willing to completely overlook that he wasn't in control and just take the win, which feels very Stan like not questioning that, not really worrying about it even as a concept, just being like, well, I don't know what that was, but everybody loved it. So that's fine. And just deciding that he is going to go along with that. And honestly, I kind of get that, (laughs) you know, like there really comes a point where if you don't have an explanation for something, but it seems like it worked in your favor and it didn't cause you to like lose everything you cared about why not just accept that and and be grateful that that worked out and not fucking look a gift horse in the mouth the problem is that he is like really unwilling to listen to mabel and dipper now because he thinks that somehow he has like zeroed in on this amazing part of of his like lizard brain that knows what to do and that all he does all he has to do is uh follow his own instincts and everything will work out and be fine. And when they are trying to get him to wear the suit and tie, he is wearing some like old seventies style, like a open collared wide lapeled shirt and this medallion necklace. That's just, it's a very, it's, it's a great look, honestly for, for Grunkle Stan. It's fantastic. 
Um, and he is annoyed at the fact that they are trying to tell him what to do. Not It's not just because he thinks that I obviously am doing great without your help. Why don't you mind your business? It's because, as we know, he did this because he felt like these kids were not really looking up to him the way that he wanted. And so he thought if everybody in the town really liked him, they would be sure to follow, that the kids would also respect him. But they're pushing him around in a way that implies they don't respect him the way he was aiming for. And he's very irritated about this. So this is when Dipper says, you need to take things more seriously if you haven't. And Grunkle Stan snaps and is like, um, I've been doing amazing without your dumb advice. And Dipper cannot take it anymore and just yells about how every one of those speeches happened because we were controlling you and completely gives up the game. This is one of those moments where it is super duper relatable, but also extremely, extremely bad idea. And I've talked about this before, especially with shows like um, Veronica Mars, where Veronica Mars has to sacrifice her pride a lot of the time in the moment in order to get what she wants later on. And while the getting what she wants later on is absolutely worth it, because she gets to take down somebody who is like an active bad guy, usually. The thing here is... You, I want her to take people down and cut them down to size in the moment because my pride can't really handle it. I've said before, I would make a really lousy like spy or private eye because you have to be willing to like let yourself be humiliated in order for people to underestimate you so that you can go on and do what you need without them ever thinking that it would be you that did it. And I just can't. My pride is too much, man. I always want to prove that I know what I'm doing. And if somebody who thinks that they're better than me is incompetent, I can't resist fucking poking them and showing them up. I can't. I can't help it. So this is like I'm watching this happen and I'm like, oh, Dipper, what are you doing? And at the same time, I'm like, I would absolutely have done this also. It's a it was it was a dumb move. It was bad. But I know that I would have also snapped because him being like, I don't need your stupid advice. Oh, forget it. Forget it. So he runs out of there. Stan does uh, saying that he can win without either of them. And of course, we know that this is not going to work out. Dipper decides that they need another candidate. And so they decide to put this on Seuss again. I it's unclear whether or not Seuss is aware of what's happening to him here and this was the only thing that like kind of like made me a little bit icky about it is I am not sure if Seuss was told what was going on here. Do they just put this tie on his neck and then begin to control him to enter the race or do they sit down with Seuss and be like Hey, Seuss, so we have this tie and we really think that, you know, somebody needs to go in there and like mitigate things for Grunkle Stan. If you will agree to it, we're going to do this thing because I really don't want Seuss to have just been completely controlled from start to finish regarding entering this race. I'm protective of him and that just seems mean and I don't want that. Um, anyway, so we have the... um the debates and we get to see uh bud with the fucking glowing eyes because he's gideon and grunkle stan notices seuss uh is backed by dipper and mabel and can see that the two of them are controlling what seuss is doing and is very resentful of this whole thing the whole the the questions by the way that Grunkle Stan is being asked. He is answering so poorly. And it's clear that he really expected that if he went up there and was just himself, that he would show them. But it does not work. He's talking about waging wars on neighboring cities. <laughs> we have the cannons. It, and it's like clear he's trying to like create a slogan or something. 
And everybody starts booing him and he is taken totally off guard by that. Um, and I, I, I felt a little bit bad for him. Grunkle Stan is, I don't want to say he's genuinely trying, but this is something that he, 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 it's like one of the few things that he has attempted outside of his comfort zone. And so for him to crash and burn this bad, I just, I don't know. I still really have a lot of sympathy for him. Um, Seuss being, I promise a kitten in every pot. That doesn't make any sense, Mabel. You don't make any sense, Dipper. Oh, God, guys. Um, Oh, no, I navigated away. Sorry, this Disney video thing is just killing me, guys. It's really annoying. Um, Did anybody tell me what the name of the dude who says get it? is because I am just dying. I can't believe I don't remember that. Um, let's see. But, 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 oh my God. I forgot that Gideon is saying things like friends because it's in the, uh, the subtitles spelled F W E N D S. Um, these politicians are dancing around the issues. Well, I can sing around the issues. And he starts singing with his spangled pants. Crime is bad. Crime is so bad. Vote for Bud and it ain't going to be no crime. <laughs> Crime's bad. Vote for Bud. <laughs> and after he says this, the woman moderating says very, very seriously, you may now throw your bird seed. And it's just the most perfect cap to this whole scene. It's so good. Oh, my God. Melanie says his name is Tyler Cute Biker. Oh, my. I can't believe that I did not. I've never heard that. Is Has that been mentioned? I don't remember that. Wow. All right. Well, that's a name. Um, so everybody throws their bird seed into Bud's bucket and Stan is extremely agitated at the fact that, uh, he has fallen this far behind this immediately after rejecting advice. Mabel and Dipper, for their part, are noticing how weird Bud is behaving and they are trying to piece together what could have happened. And then Bud walks out. And Gideon is on the screen in his stomach. Now, what is this? What is the screen in his stomach that has appeared? What is this thing? Because when he possesses his dad, this isn't part of it. Is it supposed to be that the screen like has appeared as part of this spell? Is it? It's just such a weird thing. And, you know, you need it for Gideon to really prove very immediately that he has possessed his dad. Otherwise, this doesn't work. But. Oh, my God, I just got so like I was like, what the fuck is happening here? So anyway, I love the fact that Gideon, like he sees that they were mind controlling Stan and he congratulates them for being more evil than he they he ever gave them credit for <laughs> which uh you know he's basically doing the same thing except much more literally so i don't see why they they don't have a leg to stand on here when they're doing the same shit that gideon is doing maybe that should cause you to have a little bit of like self-reflection kids maybe that should be your wake-up call that shit ain't okay so gideon takes them up into the uh the statue or the monument that they're carving of the mayor and gets them all hooked up to dynamite because he's going to blow them up and take his revenge. But, oh my God, I love that he offers for Mabel to become his wife and escape. And he has that wedding dress he made in crafts and tells her not to ask what it's made of. And it's definitely like 40% band-aids and probably like 50% human skin. And, maybe 10% pieces of that pillowcase that his cellmate took for a wife. Um, so they go back down to finish their debates up and Grunkle Stan has done super poorly, but then he sees Mabel and Dipper are hanging by a thread 
from, I think from the nose, yeah, from the nose of the monument. And he strips off the uh, sleeves of his blazer and shirt and climbs up. And the whole crowd is like totally enchanted watching him do his like action movie thing, which I said, you know, when he was fighting those zombies, Grunkle Stan, he can be impressive when he feels like doing some physical stuff. All right, Grunkle Stan. And he grabs them just as the like rope breaks and admits to them uh, <laughs> that he wanted the kids to see him as a hero and that, you know, the sh- the town admiring him wasn't enough. He wanted their respect. And Mabel is saying, we should have supported you, win or lose. And Dipper says, probably lose. And Grunkle Stand responds with, you know, I can still drop you, right? <laughs> And then he pulls them up and gives them a hug. And the whole town is cheering and throwing all of their bird seed into his bucket and elects him. And uh, Bud grabs the like detonator for the dynamite. I love that Grunkle Stan says to Dipper and Mabel, if I die, make sure I get a bigger tombstone than Ford. And they both give this like very firm nod. Stan grabs the two of them, leaps off, and lands in the pile of birdseed, which breaks his fall, and he's fine. And Bud, running away from the falling shrapnel of the explosion, breaks the screen that had apparently, like, linked him with Gideon, and that breaks the possession somehow. Again, the screen thing does not make any sense. I don't get it, but it's fine. And then we have the mayor pick an eagle escape from its uh, (laughs) escape from its little cage, drop down beside Stan and gently kiss him on the head. And it is probably the single weirdest moment of this entire show so far. I don't know what to say about that. I mean... I really don't. I really don't know what to say about it. And Grunkle stands standing on this pile of birdseed and having no sleeves with the town cheering for him and the half obliterated demolished statue of the old mayor behind him is just so it's good. However, they get home and despite the fact that Grunkle Stan got 95% of the vote, he has this horrific criminal record. And so he has been disqualified. And I love that when uh, Mabel asks him, what did you do? There's no like, I didn't do anything. I don't know what they're talking about. He just says, what didn't I do? And she talks about how he invented a new crime called uh, in in a burgle bezelment. That's right. First degree llama side that llama knew too much. Um, and they have eventually like a uh, scrolling description of all of his crimes. And they include things like telling jokes that go on way too long. Come on, we've got shit to do. Basically, <laughs> the stack, first degree thermometer theft, pug trafficking, um, snack. I'm trying I'm going to pause it and see if I can read them all. Um, let's see. First degree, thermometer theft, pug trafficking, snacks evasion, pickpocketing, woodpecker baiting, impersonating a dentist, general indecency, golf cart theft. Ah, he turned it off too quick. I'm going to try it again. Dan, Stan, let us see your crimes. Answer for them. Oh, I love cute biker in the background. Bingo fraud, telling jokes that go on and on. I mean, we have things to do. Uh Bingo fraud. So, yeah, he does not get elected mayor, despite the fact. And Grunkle Stan says, at least they didn't uh, say any of the bad ones. On an unrelated topic, I have a lot of cheap pugs and I need to move them fast. Um, so, yeah, I I thought that this was a good ending, that he, like, wins, but he doesn't actually get the job, because that would be very distracting and strange to add into the story at this point. And they have made him a banner that says, Our Hero, and he starts crying. 
and then says, come on, kids, want to go v- vandalize the man- the mayor's mansion? And they yell, yay, vandalism, and run off with him. Then there's a moment with uh, Ghost Eyes and Little Gideon where they're making friendship bracelets. And Ghost Eyes is expressing his condolences that his dad didn't win the election. If it makes you feel any better, we're going to throw a riot tonight. Does someone want to throw a riot? And Gideon says, thanks, Ghost Eyes. I'm just not in the mood. And we cut to him in his cell. And he says, this poster has kept me going. And it's one of those like, hang on baby posters with a cat. Except that it's instead of gotten like the hang in there, baby. It's got a cat that says, hold on to that branch or die cat. <laughs> and he has a little spell thing with uh with bill the weird triangle but it doesn't he doesn't have his eye and he says i'm ready to make a deal and draws the eye into in the middle of it and it begins to glow and i want to mention again we have all of these symbols around the outside there's the star uh, with its like rainbow trail, which feels like Mabel. There is a heart with a line through it, which all I can think of is Robbie with that one, but he's not like, I don't know who's a big enough character for this to like count and who isn't. Um, we have a five pointed star with something in the middle. I don't know about that one. We have a question mark, which feels like Seuss. We have the uh, hand journal, which feels like that has to be Ford. But later on, there's a pair of glasses that also feels like Ford. Um, maybe that, maybe the glasses are the uh, little fucking mustache guy. That There's the fish eating a little piece of something that looks like Grunkle Stan's the symbol on his fez. There's a llama, which I don't know anything about what that can be. And then there's a bag of ice. Um... I don't know. Is that like, and then there's a tree, which I think is Dipper because of the tree on his hat. But all of these like feel like they mean something for the people individually. And I can't put it together. I don't, I don't know. But yeah, so that's how this ends is with him saying that he's ready to make a deal and shit going glowing. And uh, it is time for us to move into the final phase of the season, I sense. So Um, So anyway, thank you very much to Melanie for commissioning this episode. And uh, I hope that you guys enjoyed the coverage. I apologize for being late. And I will be seeing y'all again soon with a new episode. Until then, toodaloo, motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast. <laughs>